This is the second video of three on the events of Japanese expansion in the 1930s. This video specifically will focus on the Second Sino-Japanese War, as it's called, sort of the lead up to that from Manchuria in 31 to this in 37, and then um, on to about 39. This will not really cover the international response, however, that'll be the last video of this series. So there was really no cessation, cessation, <laughs> uh, great start. There was no real stop um, to fighting between Japan and China after the invasion of Manchuria. Um, pretty quickly, the Japanese formed the China Garrison Army outside of the Manchurian border and slowly began moving into the rest of China through 35 and 36 in brief incursions. In Hebei province, two pro-Japanese newspaper editors were killed by Chinese rebels, which led to Japan declaring the Chinese must withdraw from that province. The Umezu Hei Agreement of June 1935 led to China leaving Hebei province and Japan declaring a puppet state there, known as the East Hebei Autonomous Council. An agreement in late June of 1935 also removed remaining Chinese troops from the Manchukuo border and Chirar province. Later in 1935, in Inner Mongolia, fighting erupted between pro-Japanese and pro-Chinese factions, eventually leading to Japan helping Mongolia to declare the state of Meijiang, or Mongoland. In response to these brief conflicts, Chinese warlords captured Chiang Kai-shek and held him captive in what's known as the Qishan Incident in December of 1936. We talked about with this with, um, with China. Basically, they held him captive, kidnapped him, until he finally agreed to stop focusing on the communist and form a second united front to fight the Japanese threat. Chiang Kai-shek agreed, but no immediate plans were made at that time. Finally, the skirmishes and tensions reached a boiling point in July of 1937. Japanese and Chinese troops stationed at the Marco Polo Bridge near Beijing began shooting at each other. This incident, known as the Marco Polo Bridge Incident, led to Japan demanding an apology, claiming China had fired first. When China refused, Japan sent full armies into the country to fight, and the, Jap or the Chinese uh, likewise followed by sending armies in. Chiang Kai-shek also sent planes to begin bombing Japan-controlled parts of Shanghai in August of 37. The Second Sino-Japanese War had officially begun. However, important to note that once again no war was officially declared by the Japanese government. Instead, each succeeding battle and fight were labeled incidents. The next incident focused on the city of Shanghai. Shanghai was known as the Paris of the Orient. It was a very cosmopolitan city on the coast. Japan had little difficulty in provoking an affair that led to pretenses for an invasion there. A Chinese newspaper in Shanghai had deplored a recent failure of an assassination attempt on Hirohito, and so the Japanese used that as an excuse to invade, calling it the, quote, Emperor Disrespect Incident. On August 15th, Japan formed the Shanghai Expeditionary Unit with the goal of taking the industrial city of Shanghai. The plan was to quickly move on from there to towards the GMD capital of Nanjing, which was about 250 miles away. The unit landed on the shores of China on August 23rd, along with a bombing campaign of Shanghai to soften the city's defenses. Japanese troops had been told that this whole effort was going to be fairly easy, only taking a couple of weeks. Instead, fierce guerrilla resistance by the Chinese resulted in Shanghai's capture taking months. Chiang Kai-shek did not give the retreat order until October of 1937. Further complicating the matter was for the Japanese was that at this time the international community was beginning to keep an eye on what was happening there. By 1937, the global picture had changed since Japan had last invaded Manchuria in 1931. 
Hitler was now firmly in power in Germany and provoking international crises by encroaching on territory. Italy had invaded Ethiopia and brutally suppressed the population, and the Spanish Civil War was well underway. The international press viewed the outbreak of war between Japan and China as one more indication that global conflict was coming. Further, they saw the Japanese as the aggressors, and photographs and media proved this point, especially of the bombing of Shanghai. One famous photograph, photograph known as Bloody Saturday, depicted the bombing of Shanghai um, and was seen by hundreds of millions across the globe. It depicted a Chinese baby crying within the bombed-out ruins of Shanghai South Railway Station and became emblematic of Japan's atrocities in China. The photograph was denounced by Japanese nationalists who argued that it was staged. This photograph, by the way, I think is similar, I don't know if you remember a couple years ago, to this photograph of a boy um, who had survived a bombing in Syria um, during the Syrian Civil War, and it was a similar sort of image in my mind. Those that argued Japan was an aggressive and brutal oppressor would find further evidence with the next actions the empire took in China. After Shanghai was finally taken in October to November of 1937, soldiers began the march towards Nanjing, the capital. The troops were frustrated at Shanghai taking so long, and their leadership promised that Nanjing held rewards for them. Combining with this frustration and promise of rewards, Japanese troops were encouraged to live off the land, eating food, taking shelter, and plundering along the way. The leadership actually gave an order known as the Three Alls. Kill all, burn all, loot all. The so-called Nanjing Massacre, or Rape of Nanjing, really began en route. As troops marched from Shanghai to Nanjing, they pillaged and killed Chinese civilians. After some fighting between GMD troops and the Japanese, Chiang Kai-shek gave the order to fall back in December, leaving the city open to Japanese occupation. As the Japanese occupied the city, some GMD troops continued to fight using guerrilla techniques, hiding out in civilian clothing during the day and sabotaging at night. This resulted in increasing anger at the Chinese population of Nanjing, and the Japanese viewing them all as suspect. Soon, Japanese troops began rounding up civilians and executing them en masse. Rape and mutilation were common. Historians debate the numbers, but probably around 300,000 civilians were killed, including many children and elderly people. There are many reasons given for the massacre, at times called a holocaust, by Chinese nationalists. Uh, the troops were frustrated at getting bogged down in Shanghai and having to combat the difficult guerrilla warfare. They weren't ready to try and pacify a population. They were basically just there to be troops. There was also a fear of failure and a feeling that killing was a key part of the job. Japanese soldiers were treated brutally by their officers and told that Nanjing promised rewards and they should take that out on the Chinese people. Most officers came from well-off families, whereas soldiers in the Japanese army were conscripted from the countryside. POWs and incarceration was impossible, so Japan preferred to just execute anyone captured. Finally, troops also tended to hold racist beliefs towards the Chinese. This, by the way, is one very controversial um, part of the Nanjing Massacre. Um, there are those that contend that there was an event in which two soldiers had a competition to see who could behead the most Chinese civilians with swords, and that this uh, competition was published in newspapers back home in Japan with people keeping up with how many each soldier had killed. Um, there's a picture of a newspaper there in the bottom right-hand corner. I say it's controversial because there are people in Japan that say this is a made-up thing, um, as well as the whole Nanjing massacre, and that um, that this never happened. Or that if it did happen, it was a lot less than um, people in China claim. The Nanjing Massacre would go down in history as one of the worst wartime atrocities. 
The event is still a hotly debated topic in Asia today, with some Japanese nationalists, as I just said, denying the details of the event, and diplomacy between the nations made contentious by memories of the atrocities. Japan continued on past Nanjing, taking ports and railways. By October of 1938, they controlled Wuhan. By mid-1939, the bulk of China was under Japanese occupation along the coast. The new capital of Chongjing was bombarded heavily by the Japanese, but never fell. This resulted in Japan looking for ways to begin cutting off supply lines to the Chinese. A former warlord was put in place as the new president of China with a capital at Nanjing, a sort of puppet state for the Japanese, while the GMD and the communists continued to operate elsewhere. Much like Manchukuo and others, this was another puppet state. Despite occupying key parts of China, Japan found China was more difficult than they had anticipated. When invading in 1937, they believed it would be quick and easy, much like Manchuria had been, or the First Sino-Japanese War had been. However, Chiang Kai-shek's strategy against the Japanese this time was to trade space for time, retreating and hiding until opportunities struck to attack the Chinese troops. This guerrilla combat staged by the United Front meant that they would have to capture and pacify parts of the country, something that the Japanese were not really uh, ready for. Further, the actions in China had contributed to Japan's economic and diplomatic isolation from the world. Sanctions followed, and Japan was losing resources fast. By the late 1930s, Japan was looking for a solution to solve their problem of being stuck in China. Their answer would be expansion into Southeast Asia and widening the war. And I'll leave you with this quote from a historian who says, The Japanese really had no plans for conducting a war and pacifying the country at the same time. Third-rate political generals with no more background than that of a military college were trying to meet first-rate political problems. A complete collapse of opposition was what they expected. In this, they were disappointed. Conquest was rapid, but incomplete. 